Hey, welcome everybody. So, so glad you could make it to our rescheduled, but um, highly anticipated, I guess you could say, uh, Workplace Law Forecast 2024 webinar. Uh, my name is Rich Menegello. I am the Chief Content Officer uh, for Fisher Phillips. And today I'm joined by um, our uh, Chairman Managing Partner and our featured presenter today, John Polson. John, how are you? Well, I'm doing very well. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy that the ice storm that caused us to cancel last time uh, has is over and that I did not try to go to the office in the rainstorm that we had here today in Southern California, but oh all, man, all good. So sorry to hear that you might've gotten wet, John. Those of us in Portland, Oregon uh, really <laughs> commiserate. Um, before we get going, John, have you, do you watch um, the TV show Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David? You know, I'm not like a big fan. I've watched a couple of them here and there while trying to find my next thing I wanted to binge watch. So I, I'm not an okay. expert. For those unfamiliar, Larry David was the former producer and main writer on uh, Seinfeld, and he was sort of the inspiration for the George character, uh, you know, really cynical and 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 uh, over the top needy. He, one of his Curb Your Enthusiasm episodes has this rule that if you wish somebody Happy New Year, uh, the statute of limitations runs after just three days. So by January 4th, you can't wish people Happy New Year anymore. Um, I like to apply that to say the the statute of limitations for doing a predictions piece for 2024 runs out on Groundhog Day. So we, we squeezed it under the wire. We're able to have a predictions piece for 2024 without it being too stale. Uh, so thanks everyone for your patience in, in allowing this rescheduled uh, predictions piece that was supposed to happen two weeks ago, uh, but we squeezed it under the wire. So I think we should be all good. Um, a little housekeeping and orientation for you all. Um, one of the links you should have somewhere on your console is to our really detailed, really incredible FP uh, Workplace Law Forecast uh, report. It's 40 plus pages of detailed content, of a number of practice areas that all employers have to deal with and a number of industries as well. And we talk in depth about what happened in 23 and what's gonna happen in 24. So I recommend that you all click on that save it off to the side. You don't need to go through it during the webinar, but make sure you, you have that handy because it's it's really gonna be a good blueprint for you for, for the coming year. Um, there's a chat feature below if you have questions for us. We'll try to get to a few if we can. Um, this is a massive webinar with thousands of people online, so I can't, I, I promise you, I can't get to them all, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and you all are eligible if you uh, for HRCI or CLE credit and the code is going to be provided to you in a thank you mail that you're going to get in a, a few hours after the event concludes. Um, John, I think it's important to orient everybody before we really dive in. This report is full of good practical stuff that I think any HR generalist or a practitioner would want to know. But it's also designed for the higher level uh, reader as well, the business owner, the in-house counsel, uh, the board member even, the C-suite executive. Tell, tell us about uh, about why that's so important for you and when we design this report, sort of the overall aim to make sure we're addressing both audiences. Sure, it might help to start with the, the genesis of the program. This came about around two or three years ago. I was presenting to a board of directors at their annual meeting and the title they gave me was Looking Around Corners. And they told me, we just want you to come in here and predict for us what you think is coming down the pike uh, with respect to labor and employment and workforce management. And that led to uh, the report, um, and the goal is to cover what a board of directors uh, might need, uh, business leaders, executives, as, as well as human resources, obviously, uh, the whole gambit, being really careful not to just be a news reporter talking about what already happened or what's coming down the road so that the business can plan because labor and employment issues now impact basically every aspect of the business, so they, they have to be part of strategic planning. Excellent. And so we worked really hard with the thought leaders in all the different corners of our firm to make sure they weren't just doing a rote, here's what happened in 2023, but a real interesting predictions uh, analysis for where they expect their, their areas going in 24. And so let's dive right in. 2023 was a massive year for our firm in, in a few respects. And, um, and 24 is shaping up to be an incredible uh, year as well. Uh, especially in one area, and that's artificial intelligence. I, I, I don't think there's a firm out there that, that was over it the way our team 
uh, was all over the way AI exploded onto everyone's consciousness in, in 2023 due to all the generative AI advances. So um, on your in your report, when you eventually look at it on page four, right at the beginning, you're gonna see the, the recap for the past year and predictions for the coming year. So John, I'll just, I'll just open it to you here. The first thing we're here talking about is the need for employer policies. A lot of folks might think, ah, we don't have AI in our workplace, we don't need a policy. But there's so many risks and, and new dangers out there that, that require employers to think about this in a different way. That's, it's so true. Um, there, there is AI in many things, and it has been that way for a number of years. And now, of course, we have generative AI, which has the ability to create things and make decisions on behalf of humans, essentially, as their, as their surrogate. And uh, most people start with, well, is this going to be like Skynet, where the world gets blown up by a robot? And I don't like to start there. I, that's like the last thing to talk about. Uh, it sounds super rudimentary, but the policy thing is a really big deal. We, we had Keith Sonderling, who's an EEOC commissioner, a political appointee approved by the Senate, uh, speak at our AI conference. And then again, at People Law, which is our human capital management conference that happens in, uh, in LA, uh, which was last week. Um, and both times he said, look, you need to look at AI like sexual harassment policies and prevention. You need to have a policy, uh, you need to do audits, you need to do training, and then say to the EEOC when we come knocking, we did the best that we could. Um, and that's going to be the best defense that you can have because um, very few people in this meeting are experts at reviewing algorithms and deciding whether one line of them is a problem when it comes to discrimination. So it's policies are the first defense. And um, for those of you who want to dive deeper, on page four of the report that's linked on your console, not only is there an article talking about the 10 things you need to have in, in a workplace policy, we literally have a link where you could download a free policy. Just go ahead and, and, and start using it um, right away if, if you haven't yet, uh, because it is it is that vital. Um, now, policies aren't, aren't the only thing that are important for employers. I know you and I talked talked on the side a little bit about other things when when an employer comes to you and says why should be worried about AI what are some of the other things that you've talked to them about in terms of the why or how to address it yeah well uh, I guess they, they go hand in hand right yeah I guess so so let, let's talk about popular human resource programs and how, how how they operate so a number of those now have hiring uh, pieces to them and a lot of those tools, particularly the new ones, are uh, sourcing candidates but by deciding which ones you should look at, um, screening candidates. Some of them even go so far as to interview the candid candidate. And we could talk about that in a different session. You can hear about more of, more of it from our AI forums and at our conferences. The bottom line is, you know, th these things are very popular. And so what to do about it is um audits and dealing with the vendors appropriately starting with the vendors so i mean it's very typical to get a software agreement and just sign it and say well they're not going to let me revise it so i'm just going to sign it and, you know I, and i get that i've certainly been in that position a bunch of times but when it comes to ai now you've got to do a little pushing and digging to see exactly what ai are they using does it have the potential to engage in discriminatory acts and will you be protected from that if the vendor is at fault uh, as opposed to you misusing uh, the product. So that, that's, that's a piece of it. And in terms of audits, you know, probably before long, you won't, you won't have any choice but to do audits. Uh, so you might as well start now. Um, and by audits, what we mean is looking at what the tool is actually doing to your population, perhaps comparing into what your population looked like before you used the tool. Uh, for example, uh, I think the commissioner gave this example. Well, I won't swear to it, but I think one example he gave was the tech uh, for a big IT company, decided to start preferring men over women because if it looked at 10,000 employees that came before, it decided that the men did a better job than the females did. Horrible. I mean, that's exactly the nightmare that we're all worried about. But all the machine was doing was following instructions, you know, and, and you're responsible for those instructions doing those types of things. So you you got to audit. And in New York City, it's just required uh, to have an annual audit. And I, and I know Rich is our, 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 our chief when it comes to these things and content. You probably know better than I the other states that are looking at it uh, or have done it, but there's, there's a handful of them. 
you can you can guess the main one that's looking at it, John. There's the, the <laughs> legislators in California are tripping over themselves to pass the first AI bill in the state. The the tech company that you're talking about, yeah, and the reason why the data was bad is because the, the folks who had created the program fed it a disproportionate number of resumes of male engineers who were doing a great job for them. And so, of course, the, the machine spits back to them. Well, the great candidates are the ones that look like the candidates you gave me. So that, that's the whole, you know, garbage in, garbage out uh, right. kind of scenario, right? Right, um, and you, you, you trained me well. I didn't name the company. So I, I credit that to you uh, as training yeah. appropriately. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. um, we're trying to keep all employers happy on this call, John. <laughs> um, right, exactly. <laughs> what the the other another thing that happened in this past year, and, and a lot of people might feel feel it was far afield for what they care about, is the Hollywood strikes and the settlements there. And a key component of those Hollywood strikes involved artificial intelligence, and you know whether whether they were signing over rights to just having their likeness um, forever repeated by a robot and, and not getting paid for it. And even though those might, you know, you you might not be a Hollywood uh, movie studio as an employer, those strikes I thought taught a really good lesson about this new phenomenon we're hearing about, which is instead of FOMO, fear of missing out, it's FOBO, and that's the fear of becoming obsolete. That a lot of your employer employees out there, all the folks who are on the line, when you're starting to introduce AI, the first thing people are going to ask is, "Am I going to be replaced by a robot?" As somebody whose job involves creating content, John, I'm worried that this might be the last webinar I'm on because you're gonna find a robot that can write better than me. So tell me, I, I know th there's a great sort of article that we have in the, um, in the report on page four talking about some techniques employers can use to bring AI in without upsetting the balance too much or making people feel okay. But I'm not sure if you have any thoughts about some good strategies employers can take as they're introducing AI not to freak out their employees. Well, I mean, the, the implementation of the tools is, is where the magic is in terms of what you say to the employees about you know, what their future is with that tool. Um, I think there already are a lot of examples where the tools don't eliminate people. In fact, uh, they create jobs because the tool suggests that you should be doing a few things you're not doing and a human's got to do it. Uh, so now you're adding jobs as opposed to taking away jobs. And Rich, I mean, you know, all lawyers, not not just um, someone in charge of content like you, have to be worried about being replaced, and we're not. I, I, I like you, I'm one of those people that uses AI every day doing my job. Um, and all it does is add more things for me to do, more ideas, and, and do things better. Um, and it's incredible. I, I give you the example, um, I guess I can say this publicly, we, we had a managing partner meeting, and I asked them to create a special kind of a business plan. Uh, and it was a group exercise tabletop, you know, the typical CEO driven thing. And the general counsel in the back of the room asked chat GPT to do the exact same thing. Blew everybody away. I mean, it was better <laughs> than anything I got from any tabletop. There was a lot of overlap, uh, but it was remarkable in five seconds. It thought of everything the room did. I, I think folks, you all heard him say, and this is recorded, um, that I'm secure, I have a job for life. So I'm glad we got that out of the way. I tricked John into that. Um, so let me just move on real quickly before yeah. we rescind that. AI note takers, I think we were one of the first, if not still remaining the only firm who wrote a really detailed article about AI note takers and, and the things employers need to consider about them. For those unfamiliar with the concept, you may occasionally pop on to a Zoom call where all of a sudden there's another participant and it could say something like fireflies.ai or something like that. And it's, it's another participant and that participant's a robot. And that participant is going to record everything that's being said, create an incredible transcript and a task list about like, Rich, after this call, you have three these three things you need to do. And the sentiment of the of the room was 80% positive, but let's, you know, so it does some incredible things and has some great advantages about not only, you know, not only in terms of convenience and efficiency, but accessibility as aspects. But there's also some dangers that go along with that. And so um, besides, people being able to refer to that article we wrote. I know, John, note takers are a really big thing for you that we've talk, talked a lot about and, and you've thought a lot about as well. Right, I have. Um, there's such a wonderful idea. Um, and in fact, when I first heard about one of them, I won't name them, uh, I went to our IT department and said, I have to have this in like yesterday. Uh, and so they pushed back because of IT security and all kinds of things. And I finally got my way as I tend to do. And then I got it and they, and they said, let us walk you through how this thing works. And when it was over, 
I was scared to death. I said, <laughs> delete my account. Um, I'm never using it again. Why? It's tape recording everything you say. Um, and if you would not put a tape recorder on the boardroom table or your desk and tape a conversation, then it's not an appropriate time to use an AI note taker. Um, and not only is it recording, but that recording is then hosted at a vendor that you have no control over. And if they have a cyber breach and all your CEO's meetings on Zoom are now recorded through a note taker, they're all going into the public domain. Real concern, there's a concern that there may be a waiver of the attorney-client privilege with respect to client communications that are recorded by an AI note taker. There's the concern for accuracy. Uh, what if uh, a bug gets into the machine and it starts inserting things that don't belong um, in, in the meeting notes? And, and I, could, I could go on and on, but let me just say, I'm not here to condemn these things. Um, I, there are appropriate uses for them, uh, but you have to be careful about how you use it. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, it replicated the question that I was about to ask you um, in a more precise way. Stephen asked, um, when you look at 2024, what do you think about relating to AI regulation, which is you know the, the main thing? You've had the benefit, John, of not picking the brain of not only commission, EEOC Commissioner Keith Sonderling, who, who is focused a lot about AI, we had the benefit of meeting with and hearing from uh, Congressman Ted Lieu, who is what the only computer scientist in Congress and highly focused on AI. He came to our AI conference and spoke a little bit. What, what, are, what are your thoughts about what employers can expect after hearing from those two people and putting on your thinking yeah. cap about what 2024 is gonna bring? Sure. Yeah, we've heard from them and, and others, you know, that we have worked with in Washington, D.C. And it's crystal clear what, what's going to happen here, I think. Uh, uh, Ted Liu, who um, has a Stanford uh, degree in computer science and is considered to be probably the most technologically sophisticated member of Congress. Uh, and to validate that is more than just politics. Um, Time magazine named him to their top 500 list of AI significant people, something like that. Um, so anyways, listening to him, one thing. You probably all realize this in this meeting. Congress can't do anything. Um, it's an election year, which makes it worse. And even without that, the way everything aligns in terms of the numbers and what's going on, it's unlikely that they will ever be able to pass an AI bill in the next couple of years. Um, I met with, uh, well, I wish I could remember her name. She's from uh, Washington State, another legislator who thinks that data privacy might be doable. Um, I still really doubt that, but her thought was, data privacy first and then tack AI on to it. But the short version is no legislation. What about regulation? Um, regulation at the federal level, um, probably, uh, but not to the extent you would extend, uh, you expect. Uh, EEOC Commissioner Sonderling said, don't expect the EEOC to issue regulations. We don't want to get into the, the weeds on the technology. We're not gonna do it. So it's gonna have to be somebody else. Uh, DOL, maybe, but they have the same problem, probably, of not having the resources. FTC, maybe. Um, but what's almost certain is state-level regulation. So that's what we all need to be ready for, is a patchwork hodgepodge of states regulating. And it's going to be one of these typical things where, I'll just throw out some states, California, New York, and New Jersey go first, and then another tranche, and then, and then others come in and say, okay, me too another tranche and another tranche, it'll likely go like that. Okay. And by the way, on that time 500 list, I heard they didn't release it, but I heard I was like 501 or 502 or somewhere, somewhere there. So I was close. Uh, so that, I'm glad we had Congressman Liu instead of me talking. That, about sounds, that sounds like something chat GP told you to try to make you feel good about yourself. Yeah, maybe, maybe if not, let's move away from AI. We, we could talk about this all day. We've, we've, we've eaten up a third of our time just talking about yeah, AI. Right. We've got so much to get to, but the next really big thing that happened to our firm in 23, which is great because I think informs employers about something they should be considering as well, is international expansion. Um, we opened up offices in in Mexico City, um, in Mexico City, and other uh, and other places in Mexico. So tell us, John, about I guess the the what we did and why we are sort of helping mimic what a lot of employers are doing now, and that's taking a fresh look at doing business down uh, south of the border. Right. So we've had a robust international practice group for a long time, uh, but our philosophy has been to not have uh, actual FP offices in, in other countries. And then the leader of that group, uh, Bill Wright, 
um, several years ago, introduced me to a, a person who is now the managing partner of our Mexico practice, uh, Herman. I'm not going to try to get his last name right, but uh, Herman. And, you know, I got to know him over the course of, of a while, a year or so, and learned that there are many factors in Mexico that have lined up that makes, makes it a great place for people to nearshore at a time when geopolitical pressures um, and supply chain disruption has a lot of people focused on getting manufacturing and other services closer to home. And that resulted in a boom in Mexico. And around the same time, uh, just because of the way politics lined up, not because of the boom, but because of the way politics lined up, Mexico went through labor reforms um, that in some ways make it look a lot more like an American style uh, labor and employment uh, regulation system. Um, and, and that's fascinating. And that wasn't just internal politics. It was also geopolitical politics in terms of other countries saying, we would like to do more offshoring, nearshoring in Mexico, but to do that, we need you to update uh, your labor your labor practices there in a variety of different ways. It also was part of the the new NAFTA in terms of certain basic standards uh, having to be in place for the, the the benefits of that. That was at Rich USMCA. Is that what USMCA, that was yeah. US, US Mexico MCA. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a draw. So there was a business opportunity for a labor and employment law firm, but that wasn't that was the only thing. That was not the only thing. Um, Herman and his team are the, the best labor and employment lawyers in Mexico. And of course, as the chairman of the firm, I might be tempted to say that about every one of our offices, but this is true. Uh, the, they, they came from you know one of the largest consulting firms uh, in Mexico. And before that, they were in the most significant labor and employment law firm in Mexico, which merged into the consulting firm. Um, and Herman is the counsel to uh, the employer of record um, uh, our organization association there and a variety of other things is very well connected and so are his lawyers their quality of their work is outstanding uh, and so really I like to say people were the first reason we went there because we identified talent and we recognized it and, and and we grabbed it as we do in the firm everywhere we see talent and that's like our driving force we want the talent and then it was like wow the timing is perfect and that led to you know now we have an office in not just Mexico City, but Guadalajara and Querétaro uh, as well. And I can't say where yet, but we're about to have a fourth. Um, and we've got over 30 lawyers and maybe a total of 80 people uh, in Mexico, all um, beginning in June of last year. It was, uh, it was a sprint, man, uh, to get that going. I know, I know. And we have, we wrote uh, an article with their help. It's on page 19 of that report that talks about some of the details about the advantages that we as a firm saw, but generally all employers can can realize if they if they look down there. I also want to note for the record that you tried to sort of hit me with a gotcha question and I nailed it in terms of the USMCA. So um, you only get a few of those, John, and then there's going to be technical difficulties and you won't you won't be on the line anymore. Um, I, I, I understand. Hey, you know, I left something out. Um, the one reason why. Well, first of all, humor noted that was very good. I don't mean to just brush over that, but uh, the, yeah, one reason why the people were so important is our view of the international practice of law is that in many cases, the U.S. law firm opens offices that are not really their offices. Um, they may be associated law firms, which you have less control over. Um, there are other models, and um, our motto was FP everywhere. It's not going to be a less than fulsome office in Mexico. Our, when, you, when you go into our beautiful office in Mexico City, you're all welcome to visit if you would like. The hospitality there is amazing. You walk in the door and you see the same Fisher Phillips sign that you see in my office in Irvine. And you get the same service and the same approach and they're on the same systems uh, as us, which is unusual among international law firms. They are Fisher Phillips. And I think that's a real distinguishing factor in terms of how we are pursuing our international practice. I've been to the Irvine office a lot. I've been to the Mexico City office. The food in Mexico City is better. Just got to say. 150% better. I agree. Yeah. Um, looking at 2024, John, you also obviously happen to be, for those who have worked with John before, know that um, you're the co-chair of our firm's PEO and staffing uh, group. And I know that you've thought about really, you know, um, spent a lot of time thinking about how PEOs 
um, can offer a, a really interesting solution for those employers who are looking to expand into international operations. Um, tell, tell folks a little bit about that. Maybe some people are unfamiliar with the, even the concept of PEOs, but why they could be a really good stepping stone into across the border. Yeah, so PEO stands for Professional Employer Organization. And in the United States, that is the standard term. Outside the United States, you'll hear PEO, um, employer of record, you may hear a little more often, and a lot of other acronyms that have come up. I mean, sometimes they call it business process outsourcing, an American concept, obviously, but uh, as well as international as well, where you put a call center in a different country. But um, employer of record and PEO, they, they take over the employment responsibilities in the country in terms of paying people, handling the, the social benefits, which are a much bigger thing outside the United States, the unique taxes that go along with that. Like in Mexico, there's a profit sharing rule uh, where you have to share the profits with the employees if certain conditions are met. So they manage those things. I mean, importantly, it doesn't remove all the liability from you. Um, so if severance pay is owed, that's ultimately going to be um, you know, the user of the employee's responsibility. But they take over all the things that cause you probably to be afraid of going into another country uh, and having employees there. And that PEO concept, I, I mean, I'm becoming an advocate or an evangelist for the PEO term and concept being used in other countries. And that's something that we would like to see happen in Mexico and uh, get a, a recognition or licensing law passed there so it's easier to use the PEO model as well as the employer of record model there, as well as in uh, Colombia, um, other parts of South America and Central America. Um, that's one of our, our goals is, is to propagate this model to make it easier to do business overseas because you solve the employment challenge. Right. Um, you know, the, on page 16 of our report, uh, th there's a uh, detail about the PEO and staffing industry. And yeah. again, a review of the past year and predictions for the future. We're not going to spend a lot of time on today's call talking about the different industry focuses, but if you go on to our um, report, you're going to see a report um, in detail about construction and healthcare and hospitality and manufacturing, auto dealerships, the sports industry. So we, we have a lot of thought leaders in a lot of those industries. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper, feel free to go there. We, we can't tackle them all here today. Um, one of the things that's going on internationally is a crackdown on the global use of independent contractors, but I'm going to flip the script a little bit here because probably what's on the mind, and you can read about that in the report on page 19 or on page 16. One of the things I want to talk about with you, John, a little bit more closer to home is uh, the Department of Labor recently issuing their final rule that would crack down on independent contractor classification here in the U.S., and it's supposed to take effect on March 11, it would make it much more difficult for uh, businesses to classify workers as independent contractors, and many more of them would be classified as employees. Um, what's your prediction about what we see on or before March 11th about whether that rule um, uh, takes effect as, as, uh, as slated? Well, there's a good chance that it'll get held up by litigation. Um, it's hard to say, you know, if that happens or it's also possible that it gets pushed out. The, 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 there are a lot of economic forces that are at odds uh, with, with that rule. Um, you know, the rule is trying to essentially ignore that the on-demand economy exists in the United States uh, or obliterate it, which I don't think people will allow it to happen. Um, we saw it in California where the independent contractor law there, which looks a lot like this you know, proposed rule, um, could have caused the rideshare services to go out of business. And the rideshare services put a, a ballot, um, you know, uh, or put a measure on the ballot, excuse me, to carve them out. And they won fairly handily because people don't want their Uber going away. Uh, and so <laughs> something similar could happen with this because it's got the same, the same uh, impact. And I mean, I find it very disheartening, honestly. I mean, you know, talking to young people in business today Many of them have side hustles, and that's just part of their culture. Um, and in fact, I've seen someone say to someone else, so what's your side hustle? As if there's an assumption that everybody has a side hustle. And a lot of those go away uh, under this new independent contractor standard because they're not sustainable on an employment model platform. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, I know when we had our, our 
we were talking to our government relations folks next uh, last week at that People Law Conference. I think they're in the same boat as you, right? They think there's a really good chance this could be held up by litigation. But if it's not, and, and you know, as businesses and employers, you have to prepare for the worst. Um, we it, it was not finalized in time for our report. Um, so we added a link in the console as well to uh, an article that we wrote just a few weeks ago about how it, how businesses can prepare for this new rule. And it goes into a little bit more depth about what it actually requires and what the new classification system would look like. So I encourage you all uh, to, to, to check that out. Um, all right, we're halfway hey, Rich, done. I, about half, yeah. Also a quick just public service announcement because I think we may not have time to, to, to cover the way you planned. Uh, independent contractors outside the United States. Um, I don't know where this comes from. It's actually kind of funny. It probably is a good psychology study here. Many business people think that it's easier to have independent contractors outside the United States. I think it's maybe some bias that they just think there's less regulation of the workplace outside the US. And the opposite, as you know, is true. It is much harder to have independent contractors outside the United States, unless you're in a country that's just decided not to enforce the law, uh, which I could name, but I, I don't want to get in trouble. So I'm not going to give an example of that. So <laughs> very, very leery of anybody who says we should use an independent contractor outside the United States. Yeah, Herman, our, our, our managing partner in Mexico City, was talking to us about that, about not just independent contractors, but also employees and how, yeah, there's this bias thinking there's super informality. And in some ways, even though it's easier to do business down there, the rigidity and the formality of all those business relationships is so different that, than what most most folks in the U.S. are used to with, you know, at will employment being the dominant you know, doctrine, right? Exactly. It is interesting. Um, all right. Another topic near and dear to your heart, John, let's talk about data security and workplace privacy. Everyone, everyone loves talking about that. Um, we have a full uh, detail about it on our page 10 and 11 of our report. So feel free to read it there. You jump online on our website. We have a whole resource center for consumer privacy. Some people might be wondering, you know, why it is that we as a workplace law firm, we've been talking about a consumer privacy law and obviously the, the massive player in the in the country. And this is in California with the CCPA. Um, it, I, I know, you know, we don't want to get too in depth and bore people too much about data privacy, but it's so important to talk a little bit about why this is a workplace law issue, John, and not just something that that consumer facing businesses need to think about. Well, I think I will start by saying, just because we don't know the experience level of everybody who's here, data privacy is different than uh, data security. Um, and I think some people, when they say, oh yeah, when we say data privacy is important, they say, well, I have cybersecurity covered. Those are two different things. Uh, and data privacy is a much harder thing in a way in that there's not necessarily any logic to it. It's just whatever some state legislator or regulator decided you should do with data, as opposed to cyber security, where the ultimate goal is I don't want to have a breach, right? So it's a very right. different mindset. Um, California, um, it's embarrassing to have to say this over and over again, but you know, kind of led the way again uh, on onerous legislation. And the story about how it came about is fascinating for a, a glass of wine, perhaps. It really is interesting. There was really one man in the state of California that's solely responsible for that happening the way that it did. Um, and you know, lots of detail about what data can be stored, what data can't be stored, um, how you store it. And then there's the thing I know you're going to next, which is deletion, uh, which is, so it's not about storing, it's also about deleting the data and people asking you to please delete their data. And now you might have to in many places. What, um, we, we had the benefit of having the managing director of the um, IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals at, at our conference most recently too. And, um, you know, he, he, he spent a bunch of time talking about all the states that are, are uh, passing uh, laws. You, you know, I can't remember the number that it's up to right now. If there's any silver lining, it sounds like most of them are not treading to the point as far as California is and saying this is definitively a workplace issue where you have to worry about your employees' uh, data. Um, I guess that's some sort of silver lining, but it still leads to a potential patchwork, right? So we're, are we right back where we started it, I guess, when we talk about that? Well, it's a great philosophical question to ask a business leader who is stuck in the mess of data privacy. I love to ask them, would you like to have the California rules apply everywhere? 
So you and your competition all have to be at the same level, or would you like to have 50 different standards and half of them might be a lot better than California? And it's like, I think I'd rather just go all the way to California than have the patchwork. And the sad thing is that the federal government with a stroke of a pen could fix this just by passing a law that says, no, we're not going to allow all 50 states to have a different rule. We're going to preempt all those things and have one rule. And there was a time in our country where Congress had the power um, to step in and say, we're not going to let you interfere with, I mean, sometimes it was couched rich in terms of interstate commerce with your constitutional law background. You would know more about that than me. But you know, Congress was really focused on not letting uh, governments of states interfere with cross-border business. And in my view, this falls in that category. Uh, and unfortunately, nothing likely is to be done about it any, anytime soon. And it's just a matter of you've got to bring the A-team in force uh, to data privacy and challenge, challenge, you know, challenge your people to fix it and get it right you know, as quickly as possible. Um. We had another question from Christine, who was asking about that data deletion issue. What is it? What What is it specifically that we have to worry about as as employers when it comes to data deletion? I know California again was one of the states that that passed a law about data deletion. Um, I don't know how much. I know we don't want to get super in depth about that, but what What are you thinking? Yeah. What's a good pra best practice for employers when it comes to data deletion in uh, twenty four? Well, I am not the data deletion expert, uh, but I will, I will say that, I mean, experts, excuse me, executives working with their IT team, they need to be prepared for more and more data deletion responsibilities. And if they want to look for examples of what that might look like, they probably could look to Europe uh, to get a head start on what it's going to look like. Today, like the Delete Act, these things are very focused on consumer uh, deletion. Um, and we have a consumer privacy practice inside the firm, not just the employment practice. So they can help you dealing with that side of your business. And then the employment side, it's murkier because you're required to maintain a lot of data uh, on employees and the state government cannot supersede a federal requirement when it comes to maintaining data. I think the tricky thing for employers is we tend to be data hoarders. Um, we just don't get rid of anything, um, you know? so. Like we, we deal with this with the GDPR in Europe, where you have to address the question, is it necessary for me to have this data? Well, in the United States, the, the old legal advice was, who cares if it's necessary? Uh, storage is cheap. <laughs> Just keep it. You might use it someday. And in the new world, that's not going to be possible in the United States. Right. Uh, Brianne had a comment here that the CPRA, which are the regulations regulating the CCPA, is silly since labor laws prevent deletion of personnel information. I don't know if we can formally go on the record and call a regulation silly, John, but Brianne might have a point. No, I think it's sort of stating the obvious when it comes to silliness. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Hey, I, I didn't want to say it. I'm glad you did. Um, <laughs> we already touched on um, your prediction for 24 about more state legislatures leading to this national patchwork. So rather than focus on that as a prediction, what's your prediction about, or just what do you think employers need to do given current levels of cybersecurity and, and what what employers should be thinking about as best practices for cybersecurity in 2024? Because that's still a thing, right? I mean, CCPA oh, yeah. and the, but cybersecurity is still a big thing. So what, what are what, what are your what are you telling employers about what they can expect in 24 and what they might do to 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 prepare? Well, I mean, I, I have the standard advice, and then I have a thought about the future. So you know, standard advice, why? So you have to have a good team, a good system. This is not an area to cut corners in, in terms of investment. Um, and good insurance, as long as it's available. Um, I, I, I question how long robust cyber insurance will be available as it becomes inevitable that everybody will have breaches. And the insurance just turns into basically long-term financing where someone predicts, well, you'll have about a half million dollars in expenses for this this year. Your premiums, $600,000. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, it, it, it may come to that. But I mean, the future is, is the problem. So um, AI will make um, data breaches easier um, for the criminals that are doing it. Um, there'll be new ways to do it. Uh, of course, it's a lot faster, large language learning models. I never can get that right. No, you did. Good work. 
they could go very quickly on this stuff, um, you know, much faster than a room full of 40 hackers. Um, so that's a concern. What does that mean for the business? Um, and what products will you have to buy to deal with that? Um, of course, the opposite thing I think about is, well, what if we become uh, like the criminals and we design those things ourselves and then we start testing our systems with it rather than just waiting to see how it works, <laughs> which is not exactly the best way to do it. And then quantum computing um, is uh, such a high level topic, uh, you know, probably not appropriate to go into much detail, but that is sort of a mind blowing thing in terms of cybersecurity and today's encryption techniques perhaps becoming obsolete. Uh, once quantum computing is actually a, a functional, up and running, you know, practical thing. Yeah, the thing that's a little bit scary about AI in the cybersecurity world. Um, it's funny the story you were telling us last week about how um, currently, if you deal with privacy professionals who are helping employers or businesses uh, deal with uh, a, not just a data breach but their data being held ransom, is that they'll say, "Well, the good news is the 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 hackers that we're dealing with right now, they're trustworthy hackers." So we have a good rapport with them. We could really trust their what they say. And so once we give them the money they want, they'll, they'll release your data, which is great. Very comforting to think about that there's a, a level of like responsible criminal out there, which I, I appreciate. Um, but with a AI could turn things around so that, like you said, in anybody's hands could have this power that right now is just held by, you know, really hackers that have invested a lot into their business and need to have that reputable reputation in order to, to get the money from a ransom. Um, so it's a little scary to think what, what could happen in the coming years if if anybody can do this and not just the good criminals, right? Yeah, no, you're, it's so true. And, and it's not just um, hacking and cybersecurity. There is a common theme that you and I just started to talk about the other night uh, about the power of technology putting major power in more people's hands. And you know that I have a concern about violence. Um, and of course, as a workplace lawyer, it's, it's really that, but I, I, I am concerned about what will happen in a couple of years when a 3D printer can print practically any kind of gun you know, in somebody's garage. And that comes about with um, not a lot of regulation and it comes about with more mental health issues. Uh, it comes about with more uh, political anxiety uh, in the country and what will employers do to respond to that? I have no doubt uh, there will be a lot more regulation, which is coming up, I realize, in the OSHA topic, so I'll stop talking about this now. Well, I mean, it's this is taking a real depressing turn, so let's move on anyway before, before we get too depressed in 2024. Uh, labor relations, that's always a fun topic to talk about. We have a really robust labor relations practice group with some really incredible folks who devote their time uh, to helping employers navigate the, the world of living with unions and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, there's a whole section there on page eight of that forecast talking about uh, what, what happened last year and what to expect in the future. Without diving too deep, John, I know we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention that there's a, a brand new, very important standard that uh, the National Labor Relations Board um, released last year that doesn't just apply to unionized environments, it applies to all employers. Are we talking about joint employer rule? Oh, I was talking about the, um, the, uh, the, the, the workplace conduct policies. Oh, sorry, right. Yeah, it's fine. So, well, and that's a much bigger impact than joint employer rule, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the stericycle case um, is one of many cases in a long line of cases dealing with what you can say in your policies and your employee handbooks. And there's been this vacillation back and forth between a position that you essentially need to let people behave however they want at work, otherwise you're interfering with their rights, um, to the other end of the spectrum of, well, no, we're going to have civil workplaces, and so that's not true. You can tell people not to yell at each other at work, and you can tell people not to record each other at work. So unfortunately, Stericycle is on you know the first category of allowing a lot more what we would call misconduct um, and making policies that interfere with that misconduct um, unlawful. And the consequences can be severe in terms of what the NLRB can do. So cutting to the chase, uh, if your employee handbook has not been reviewed in the last six months, it probably has policies uh, that violate Stericycle unless it's so old it goes back to a presidential administration many decades ago, and you just happen to be lucky. <laughs> uh, 
but you know the modern handbook needs to be updated and i know you know it's funny it's one of the mantras you hear all the time if you talk to a labor and employment attorney at some point they're going to say make sure you've updated your handbook um but we mean it this time right i mean this it's it's absolutely serious like you said there yeah. just about everybody's handbook right now is outdated unless it's been updated in the last six months so uh that needs to be addressed but let's turn to, to 2024 now um what, what you alluded to this is the big uh news that's coming right down the corner this one now it's can't believe it's this month now uh, in fe on february 26th the joint employer rule is slated to take effect i know this is near and dear to your heart given your work and sort of the alternative staffing model um situation uh, i'll let you sort of set it up talk about what the joint employer rule is and 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 then we can talk about what we expect to happen by the end of the month right so the joint employer rule with the nlra and the nlrb is similar to all other joint employer rules it's just a matter of whether two separate businesses, two separate employers can be treated as the same uh, for purposes of their liability and responsibility to comply with the law. Uh, and so in the staffing context, the question is, you know, is the temporary agency a joint employer with its end user client um, such that they have joint liability for what happens in the workplace or they both might, they might both have bargaining obligations if, they, if one of those work sites gets um, unionized and so forth. But it goes way beyond staffing. Um, my biggest concern with this new rule um, is business process outsourcing. So I'll give, I'll give a law firm example because that's the kind of business I run. So that's what I'm familiar with. Law firms often outsource uh, what we used to call the copy room. Um, uh, lawyers still deal in paper, believe it or not. So we have these huge rooms that have big photocopy machines, binding machines, uh, special machines for filing court papers that have to be done a certain way. And of course, there's the mail and all that stuff. It's very common for a law firm to outsource that to another company. And they come in and they employ the people and they run the, op the operation. But, you know, lawyers are walking in there every day telling those folks what to do. Uh, and that direction uh, and reserving under the new rule, reserving a right to control them. Merely, even if you never talk to them, a merely reserving a right to control them under the new rule may make the law firm a joint employer with that outsourcing company. So think about all those examples that might be in other businesses, car dealerships that outsource the detailing of the car to do the washing. Same situation, it could be joint, could be joint employment. Almost every major business in America now has this risk because the mantra has been, if you can outsource it, outsource it, right? That's what businesses have been told by consultants for a number of years now leading to this giant uh, industry of outsourced services, and now there's this potential problem. Um, by the way, an example: so car dealer, car car dealer. Um, the de what if the detailers don't get their lunch breaks in California? Um, the the dealer's response is going to be: the whole reason I outsource this is to not deal with that stuff. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> under a joint employer theory, they may be jointly liable. That's not a, a union issue, but that, that makes it easier to understand. I think in terms of what we're talking. Right. Uh, Jennifer asked a question about um, she'd heard something about Congress taking steps to overturn it. Um, so just generally uh, threading that question in, what do you expect to happen with this rule? Again, it's supposed to take effect uh, at the end of this month. Congress will not be able to pass something, in my opinion, um, I mean, to get the House and the Senate um, to do it and then get the president to sign it. Not going to happen um, uh, now. Litigation may stop it. Um, as with all these rules, which is this new cycle, you know, that we have now. So Congress can't do anything. Regulators do something. Then there's a lawsuit to try and stop it and just hope that there's a new administration uh, before the litigation finishes, you know. There you go. Um, workplace safety. You mentioned this a little bit earlier. You know, this is this is a thing where five years ago, if we were doing a webinar, you know, maybe workplace safety is relegated to just, eh, only risk management professionals or safety experts need to care. Nobody cares about workplace safety. Then COVID happens, and now workplace safety uh, experts are the superstars of employers. Are, are we at a point now where workplace safety can just be shoved back on the shelf and, and not worried about? Or is, is this something, what do you expect in 2024 in terms of why business leaders should or need to focus on safety? A lot more regulation and attention by the agencies that investigate these things. I mean, there's federal OSHA, but then there's state OSHAs as well that you have to worry about. 
it'll be a very active year um, in the safety industry. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, I, I think there are a number of trends out there that lead point in the direction of OSHA maybe blurring the lines of its jurisdiction um, like it did during COVID, right? I mean, you've got agencies that are making decisions that prevent a business from operating. Um, and that's very different than just, well, let's see if people up on roofs are tied down to the roof, uh, you know, and things like that. Uh, they went way beyond that. And now that they have a taste of that and they've built, let's face it, they've built the machine to be able to do it. Um, I, I, I expect to see more of that and a lot of exotic things coming up, like the role of AI and safety in the workplace, uh, you know, my pet topic, the role of extreme weather <laughs> uh, in terms of what that means for OSHA. Well, you start to have to have hypothermia training, um, you know, in remote locations where they might get stuck for a couple of days. We start to have to have food on hand. Um, if some of these trends continue, not just extreme weather, but unexpected weather. We, in our big storms in California last year that were in the news a lot, there was a gust of wind that was so strong it picked up a television set in my backyard and threw it across the yard, just out of nowhere. Uh, what, what if that happens in a workplace where half the people are working outside, right? Right, exactly. We have a bunch of resources on page 24 and 25 of our report dealing with workplace safety issues. Some, st some big stuff that happened in the past year, the stuff that we're expecting to happen in, in the coming year in terms of a new rule that's being finalized that would allow um, even non-unionized work settings to have third parties like unions walk through workplaces with OSHA inspector, workplace safety inspectors, and a new uh, workplace violence prevention plan law that's going to take effect in, in California. Read uh, those resources there. We have detailed articles about each of them. But in the time we have left, John, I, I want to uh, conclude by us talking about litigation, since this is a, a topic that essentially can touch literally every employer that's on this on this call right now um we 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 have an article on page six um of, of our uh, forecast that talks about several articles that talk about the big affirmative action ruling from the supreme court um last year and the impact it might have on employers dei uh and deia now that we're adding accessibility in there as well sometimes um their efforts there what, what are your thoughts generally i know we have details in the article but uh, should, is this something employers need to be concerned about, or is it just something that educational institutions need to worry about? Oh, it, it's definitely not just educational institutions. I mean, they certainly are, are the most immediately impacted, and, and we have a large education practice group, uh, both higher ed and K-12, through and they've been spending a lot of time with that. And I, I was interested, you can read this in the materials that are published, uh, how K-12 through is impacted. That was fascinating. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, private employers who are not in the education uh, business. Um, it will impact them in many ways, but here's two examples. One is your pipeline of workers may become less diverse over time. Um, and so for, for some businesses, they will be looking differently at DEI and how they source candidates uh, to try to address that diversity problem. Um, sort of on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there, there's the, the, the policy side that could get you in trouble. I, I, I was interested in a, I participated in a forum about this, and there was talk that a lot of what private employers do with DEI is okay after the Supreme Court decision, if you look at what they actually do. But if you look at what they put in writing about how they describe what they do, that could be a problem. And that may be what the next big case is uh, in front of the Supreme Court someday down the road when... Uh, a, an employer who's not in the education field gets dragged in and the court may try to apply the same theories. The documentation may be more important than what they actually did because, you know, I mean, we're, we're all as large employers selling our diversity um, as, as an advantage to working for us. I mean, we certainly believe that our diversity is a big advantage. I need to be careful how I say that so it doesn't sound like I'm saying something that's inconsistent with the basic principles inside that case. Right. Exactly. So uh, an attendee named Robert logged in 15 minutes ahead of time. Very first question we got and asked us, is Chevron going to get overturned? Which I love. Uh, Robert, you, you speak my language. Most of you out there might, might be asking, what is he talking about and what do we care? This is going to sound a little technical, but bear with us for a second. 
So there's this there's this uh, doctrine that the Supreme Court um, laid down about 40 years ago in a case involving the Chevron company. So it's called the Chevron Doctrine because lawyers like to say stuff like, what about Chevron when they're talking about cases and not gas? Um, Chevron is a principle that essentially says, hey, if there's a statute that Congress passed and it can be read two different ways, we're always going to defer to what the agency thinks about that. So the agency being, think about how many agencies impact your day-to-day -day life as employers, the Department of Labor, the National Labor Relations Board, the EEOC, even now like the Fair Trade Commission, which said non-competes should be banned. Well, the current makeup of the Supreme Court might not like Chevron, and in fact heard a case just a few weeks ago, uh, and it was a, a funny case. It involves some herring fishermen who are under the regulation of a, of a federal statute that says you have to have a government observer on board every fishing boat to make sure you get the right number of herring. And they said, cool, okay, if that's what the statute says, the government, the, the, reg, the regulatory body said, well, you got to pay for that person. And they said, whoa, whoa, the statute doesn't say that. You government have to pay for that person. So the Supreme Court's going to decide who's got to pay for the herring watchman. But that's going to that's going to have a really big impact on employers. So, John, tell us how that could have an impact on employers and what's your prediction about the case? Yeah, so I'll, I'll I also don't want to get too wonky on the on the law here, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about it the way I would present it if I was doing a private briefing for a board or, or for the C-suite. Here's the problem. Uh, Congress is not able to regulate much at the moment, which encourages agencies to issue a lot of regulations and fill the gap uh, uh, from, that Congress has left. Uh, like it or not, you know, sometimes we like what they do, sometimes we don't. Well, if, if Chevron goes the way you describe and the agency no longer has deference with its regulations, those regulations may no longer be worth the paper they're printed on or the screen that you're reading it on. Uh, and then who will be the watchdog? Who's going to make policy? Uh, a group that is not allowed to make policy the courts, but they're going to do it anyway. Um, in the old days, you know, we would call it common law, and it was kind of normal, right? I mean, 50, 60, 70 years ago, as the legal system in the U.S. was shifting and developing, courts would often make law, and then Congress would react and so on and so forth. Well, the courts may be the last man standing, and do you really want that? Um, you know, Congress can't get the job done. The regulator can't get the job done. So one person sitting on the bench uh, with the only accountability being whether what they say can survive an appeal, deciding what public policy is for the poor herring fishermen. Um, I, I just don't, that's not, that's not good. Uh, but the reality is whether it's good or bad, that's not really the issue. It's a matter of planning, understanding that that's the way the flow is going to go. So when the executive team is getting ready to comply with a regulation, um, you think about, well, what is the fate of that regulation if Chevron goes in the direction of the agency no longer has deference? And we're going to see, so there's an advocacy group for businesses that doesn't like a regulation that is against them, and they're going to run to a court in Texas and find a conservative judge who's going to want to strike it down. And then uh, on, the, on the flip side, employer advocacy groups and labor unions are, aren't going to like a regulation that is more favorable to businesses, and they're going to run to Washington State or New York or California, perhaps, and they're going to have it overturned. So this isn't a... Uh, a, a Republican or a Democrat or progressive or a conservative thing, this is going to happen. It's going to impact everybody. It's going to businesses are going to be more uh, regular or, or more subject to just the whims of, you know, you're going to spend months and months preparing for regulation to take effect. And then the snap of a finger, some judge is going to say, nah, we don't like that. Um, and, it, and it's going to be going to lead to real challenging times in, in, in the future if, if we expect to have happen what we expect to have happen. Well, yeah, I mean, some people already say litigation is the sport of kings. Uh, I think this may encourage that because of what you said. There'll be more and more strategic litigation to try and undo what a regulator has done because you know, the power to do that may be there. We are out of time on, on Monday. For those of you who receive our FP Weekly um, uh, mailing that we send out every Monday morning, um, we're going to have a really interesting uh, prediction piece that summarizes uh, the Chevron case in a bit more detail and how it could impact you and all the different areas. And we have several of our firm's thought leaders uh, are going to chime in and offer their predictions on how the case is going to go. And 
We also have a, we're going to send out a prediction piece on how some of our uh, attorneys think the Super Bowl is going to turn out, along with some things you might need to know as employers about things leading up to, uh, to the game. So look out for those. There's plenty more predictions coming from us. John, this has been great. This hour just flew by. Can't thank you enough for lending your expertise uh, and, and talking to us today. Thank you, Rich. I, re I really enjoyed it. And thank you, everybody who joined the, the call. We, we can't do this unless people show up. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great year. And again, starting tomorrow, you're not going to be able to make predictions about 2024 anymore because they'll be stale, but we squeeze it under the wire. Um, have a great 2024, and we look forward to the next uh, opportunity to talk to you all. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.